Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of the Faces of Business, where I talk with interesting people sharing life and business experiences to entertain, engage, build community, and provide information to help others succeed. If you're interested in learning more about one of our guests or how we are helping business owners generate wealth and build businesses they can sell or succeed at Exit Your Way, you can find more information on our website, ExitYourWay.com, or by contacting me directly, Damon, at ExitYourWay.com. I hope you enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pistolka. With me today, I have none other than Davey Warren from Paragon. Davey, welcome. Thanks. Glad to be here. Really excited Oh, for man. This. I'm excited because today we're going to be talking about CRM configuration and implementation challenges because, and we're going to talk about this later, <clears throat> Paragon is the only company that I've heard of, and I'm sure there's others out there, but the only one that I've heard of that does crm implementation but does not do marketing so yeah. i'm excited to talk about this today so davy we always like to start off with with some simple stuff so yeah. tell us how uh, your background and kind of what really tweaked your interest to get into you know helping people with crms so <clears throat> really interesting i um it actually goes back to when i came out to utah Um, I came out for a job, um, didn't get it, worked for a bunch of other companies. I met my wife and she said, you need to have like a career. And so I went and got a job at a company that worked in lead management systems is what they used to call it. So that they didn't, nobody coined the term CRM until Salesforce did. They used to call them lead management systems, um, databases, customer database, um, access database, right? Yeah. And I worked for this company and I I got into, they use Salesforce for their application that they had, they had telephony application. And I said, well, I want to, um, I like this Salesforce stuff. And I started talking to some people and they said, Hey, can you help me with it? And so I started moonlighting at night, actually helping people set up their Salesforce. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and, and a guy came to me and he said, Hey, would you want to come work for me? I do Salesforce implementation. And he's like, can you come do sales for me? And, and uh, I'll, I'll just pay you commission. And I was like, so you mean work for free? And he's like, well, yeah, but I'll pay you commission. I said, maybe not right now, but let's talk in the future. Well, lo and behold, he comes back to me a year later, hires me as his director of sales uh, for a company called Chiasma, uh, which eventually got bought by I Bailey. And I did three years professionally helping um, look at people's CRM or CRM solutions for Salesforce and got heavy in the ecosystem. I was visiting Mm -hmm. um, Salesforce and whatnot. And then um, I took a hiatus and started managing some sales teams from there. Um, and working for a couple of other companies. And I, I actually got laid off from a company I worked for. And yeah. I went home and I was like, honey, I'm tired of giving away all my, my, all my oomph, my, my hustle to go find companies. I had, I had closed some major companies uh, in eight months, um, some blue chip you know, clients for this company. I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do my own thing. And um, she was pretty pissed at me because no wife loves it when you start your own business. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> she's like, "So we're poor," and I was like, "Yes, we're poor." So, <laughs> um, so lo and behold, I started. I started Paragon, and I, um, I actually started as a CRM consultancy, and so and I and actually uh, sales consultancy, sales CRM consultancy. Um, I, actually, in the other room right now, my marketing team is going through some old marketing materials that I had that I pulled out for my my uh, closet and they say things like help your sales operations, right. Is what I was doing before. I wanted to be an outsourced CRO and I actually set up HubSpot for one of my clients. He was looking for a CRM and I said, Hey, I've seen this. It looks very inexpensive for a small company like yours. Let's try it out and I'll set it up for you. And um, I started setting it up and I went, this is pretty cool. It has a lot of features that I didn't have in Salesforce. And I was pretty heavy into Salesforce. I was highly recommending it to people And after setting this guy up, I went, you know what? I, I think I really like this. I think I'm going to sign up as a partner and see what they do with partners. Like I'm going to find out that if you're a partner with HubSpot, they treat you really well. They actually like you. Um, Salesforce, they kind of kick you to the curb a little bit, I felt like. Um, no offense to any of my Salesforce friends, but that's what I felt like when I'd go and work with them. And, and 
Um, HubSpot was like, here, hold our hand. We'll take you through this. We'll train you on everything. We'll, 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 you know, we'll, we'll help you out. And I just fell in love with it and um, started my little consultancy by November or see that was in May of 2019 by December, January of, uh, of the next year in 2020. Um, we were, uh, we were ranked as a, I think we were like a silver partner back then. And then we became a gold partner and then we became a platinum partner. And now we're a diamond partner and we're on track to be an elite, hopefully by the beginning of next year, which is a pretty big accolade. I never thought I would even be close to elite. If you would have asked me like two years ago, I was like, oh, that's okay. We'll get there eventually. So yeah, that's kind of how we got on this road. And we've been, what I love about it is we're implementing amazing companies, companies I never thought that we'd be working with. Um, Mm -hmm. Some pretty, I mean, probably like top 500 companies that have been around for a couple hundred years even. Wow. Um, and uh, they're reaching out to us and working with us because we're, we're solving some pretty cool problems. But what's interesting is CRM is so, it, it's, it's an amazing tool when people know how to use it, Damon, because a lot of people that get in and they go, oh, I'm going to buy this and it's just going to do something for me, right? They think, oh, I'm going to buy this tool. And then some guy over here who says he knows how to use it, that used it at his company as a lowly sales guy is now going to set it up for me. And that never happens. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it hundreds of times. And I can literally say hundreds because I know that I've seen over 900 systems now of companies and their processes and sales teams and whatnot wow. and CRM. And um, they th- that's usually what happens. Some guy says, I know this, I'll do it, whatever it may be. But what's funny is they miss out on the opportunity to learn how a CRM can function for revenue, Right. What is it supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to remove tasks from individuals and no CRM comes out of the box. None of them, zero zilch come out of the box, just doing what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. It has to be customized for what you need. That's why there's a marketplace for consultancies like mine and my companies need consultancies like mine. I I do this because I know there's a need. If if there wasn't a need and I was trying to make a market for it, that'd be horrible. But there's actually a, a true need because it takes a little bit of skill and some understanding and tricks of the trade. And there's a bunch of stuff right at the beginning that just needs to be set up usually on a CRM that people don't want to do, nor do you want to go study up on how to do it for 20 mm-hmm. hours. Just have yeah. you do it in two. Right. So, so anyway, so that's, you know, that's kind of where we've gone and, and, and what we want to do, we want to help people create a, a strong structure in their, in their CRM so that it's working for them, not against them. And then also just trying to help with adoption um, with sales teams. Most I'd say a lot of sales teams don't adopt a CRM when it first comes out. I mean, it's, it's pretty heavy. Even working with us, when we work with a lot of management teams, mm-hmm. it's still a struggle, but it requires management. You know, organizational change requires individual change. And the first individual to change is the management team. Once they adopt it, then it starts flowing down properly. So, yeah. Wow. So you, you said a couple things here. I just want to back up. Yeah. yeah. You've, re- you've reviewed like 900 systems. That's a lot to be looking at. It's it, it's a lot. I've been doing it for, I think I'm in my twelfth or fourteenth year now. Okay, of CRM like structure. I actually That's built. Awesome. I built my own CRM. Uh, I had a previous company actually did marketing, which is funny because I don't do marketing in this one. But um, I actually had a buddy of mine build our CRM. I didn't know what it was called. I was like, I need something where I can put my clients' names in and what yeah. services they're buying. And he was just coding it for me, like straightforward. And then I realized yeah. I was in the CRM business before I even got into the CRM business. So, Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you talk about a couple things that, that I think is pretty interesting because people that are new to CRMs look at them as a contact database in a yeah. lot of, a lot of respects. Yep. But there's so much more now. And you talked about the CRM as uh, CRM for revenue. So explain what you mean by that a little bit. Yeah. So the purpose of a CRM is to reduce friction in your life, right? So I, I need it to do something else for me that I don't want to do that's constant, right? That I'm like sending out an email or updating information or moving things through a pipeline or letting me know what steps I need to take in a pipeline. And what I have noticed is that if you if you take a sales methodology like a, a Sandler or a Miller Hyman or, or or another one, right, and you couple that with a CRM, right, so you have a sales methodology, 
and now you have a tool to use with it, you can actually produce anywhere from 20 to 30% more revenue in your company. And the reason for that is because you have a tool that now can support your process and it becomes cookie cutter and scalable, but also measurable. So when we say that it becomes a revenue general generator is because you can measure. And um, I was sitting down with a new marketing gal that we hired yesterday and I was showing her the, the funnel as we kind of funnel things through a flywheel HubSpot talks about a flywheel, which is actually even better because you're constantly mm -hmm. trying to keep things move. Right. But what I was trying to show her was that I could take a number up here of 1000, um, you know, people falling into my funnel that I get through ads or other mean networking, you know, whatever it is that I do and bring it down and say, I get four deals out of that, that close their close one. So for every thousand, I get four. So then I have to figure out how to get that same thousand and increase it to 2000. But it has to be the same personas, right? It has to be the yep. same grouping. And then my outcome should be eight, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're hoping. And so what's really cool is it's not about the thousand up here. It may be in a step in the middle. But if you're not tracking your steps in the middle, like having a discovery meeting, a contract negotiation, a demo, a trial, um, uh, a second demo, whatever it is that your process is to get people signed on. If you're not measuring that to see how many people fall through to the next level, if you just go 1,000 and go eight, you're missing out on everything in between that provides you value that you can tweak and make better. And that's where you see that 20 to 30% revenue growth because you're actually measuring what challenges you have. You're finding bottlenecks. Think of a manufacturer, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the Toyota process. You're trying to find where your bottlenecks are in your process. Yeah. If you're not measuring it, meaning if, something, if somebody's not putting input into the system, I can't measure it. So your best sales guy, I, I hear this is tales all this time, right? We'll, we'll, um, you got five sales guys on a sales team. Bob is the old best sales guy, right? He's always closing all the time. The other four are kind of, you know, the next two are pretty good. They're pretty equal with Bob. Sometimes they beat him in a month or whatever, but Bob's pretty, you know, high level. He's really close to the deal. He's got the relationships, right? That people talk about. Mm -hmm. And then you got like some junior guys and they're just trying to keep up, right? The junior guys, when Bob comes to him, Bob's just like, you got to sell guys. You got to know, you got to really know this product and you don't know this product. Well, if I was the sales manager, I'd fire Bob in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, but it's not that he, it, the producing is good, but if Bob's not helping the other guys and if I can't reproduce him, Bob's going to be gone in a year or two. And then my company's going to fall flat. If you want to yeah. keep your company going up, you got to figure out how to, duplicate him so getting him to enter in his stats gives you a sense of where he does well if you can find out where he does well then you can find out like where does he get his leads how does he negotiate with them maybe he does really good maybe these other four guys they always falter at negotiation they're doing they're getting the same numbers and then negotiation yeah. these four they stay here and bob moves forward and you go oh i know what's going on it's the negotiation period if i could get bob to teach him negotiation then they would close the same but instead what we do is we go all the way up to the top and we go we need you guys to get better leads or they go to marketing yeah. and say, get me better leads. And that's not, that's not realistic. And so marketing's over here chugging and running and trying to do stuff to try to satisfy these guys. And they're like, well, Bob's closing stuff. Is he closing our stuff? Well, he is. And he's doing a better job. We're like, well, we're just going to give more to Bob then. And so you get these guys that funnel everything over to Bob because they're like, Bob is the closer. When all, all Bob does really good is he just knows how to ask that one negotiation question or he knows yeah. how to ask about timing or who the decision maker is. So yeah, a CRM is a revenue generator. When you remove the things that cause you a bottleneck, when you start measuring what's going on, and if you don't, you think, well, I'm just going to keep Bob because he's making me money. Bob's going to start losing you money when Bob's gone. Yeah. Because you'll never know what Bob's secret sauce was unless you measure it. And it doesn't yeah. matter how many sales calls you listen to of his and you go, well, just talk like, like Bob. You didn't realize that Bob did a little bit of extra. It's like the girl at the restaurant that puts a smiley face on the receipt. And they, mm -hmm. they measured that people who put a writing like thank you or a smiley face or whatever actually got better tips or at least got tips. Mm -hmm. Nobody would know. Nobody would know that. Right. If you just looked at Sally, just got a bunch of tips. You'd be like, well, just say what Sally says. No, it's what Sally wrote down. But you didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Well, this is awesome because I want to cover a couple things that you said here. First of all, using your CRM to reduce friction in the sales process. I think that is. That is, first of all, one of the things it can do by just making it easier for you, your salespeople, and your customers if you really configure them right, don't you? Yeah, it it removes a lot of friction. Well, think about the customer journey, right? Um, 
when somebody comes in, you know, I think of the customer journey digitally, like somebody's walking into a brick and mortar store. Mm -hmm. What do they see? I used to do, I think one of the reasons I, I, one of the things that's benefited me in my life is that I've worked so many jobs. I've worked way too many. I'll, I'll state this publicly. I calculated at one point, and this was almost 10 years ago that I'd had over 35 jobs okay. by the time I, by the time I awesome. was, uh, by the time I was 35 almost. <laughs> um, but I worked retail and, but you learn a lot. Like you, you yeah. know, I, I did everything from manufacturing to retail to construction and irrigation and who knows what. It, the only thing I never was, was an astronaut. And that's the one I missed out on. But, yeah. but if you think of a retail store, you're going in as a customer, you, the first experience is, do the doors open for me? If I have to open a door, it, nobody really thinks about that, but that's a friction point for some people. Yeah. Right? Well, I can't get the door open. I got to get the stroller in. Right. But if it opens for you, you're like, Oh, I love going to the store. Right. They'll come back to it. Um, and, and some others will be like, they may skip a store. They may walk down an aisle of stores and not go into one because they'll be like, I don't want to deal with opening the door, going in, opening the door, coming out just to look at one shirt. But if they could walk right in, they would have looked at one more shirt and you probably would have sold one more shirt that day. So yeah. then you come in and you get the advertising, like here's the steals and the specials. I hate walking into Old Navy and finding the shirts just everywhere and they're on the floor and everything. I walk in and I just get dirty and I walk out, right? I can't handle it. It like drives me nuts. I like yeah. walking into like Nordstrom, right? <laughs> Even Nordstrom Rack is cleaner <laughs> yeah. than, than, than Old Navy because I'm, I, it's clean and I go, oh good, I can see things. I can actually like match them up. I mean, they have people at Costco. If you look in Costco, there's like two or three people constantly refolding restacking because everything that's pristine it gets easier so it's an experience so when we talk about the revenue experience in a crm it's the same thing what does it take to book a meeting with me do you have a way that i can book a calendar if i have to go through your email and go back and forth to try to book a time because we're emailing back and forth that becomes friction right yeah um if i have to click five buttons to try to book a meeting with you online that's friction people fall 50 percent of your they've measured this 50 percent of people drop off every click down the road and so <clears throat> that's why people are always trying to measure abandoned shopping carts online because they're trying to figure out like why didn't they buy right what caused them to abandon that and it's the same in your sales process you have to figure out why did they abandon me after the demo why did they abandon me after the price proposal solution why did they abandon me at <clears throat> after i sent the contract and they said yes but then didn't sign or they yeah. said yes signed and didn't pay I've trained, I changed my process. We used to have people sign and then I'd send them an invoice. Now I put the signature and I have a payment button on the same screen. I make, I, I make more money. I significantly make more money because it's one less step. Now so I have bigger companies that ask for an invoice, but at least for the ones that can, I get immediate payment. I had three this week <laughs> where they just said, send me the thing, I'll sign it and I'll pay. So yeah, reducing that's that awesome. friction is huge. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's, you, I'm just writing down notes because you said so many good things here. Where do people leave in your process? Where do you see them dropping off? I mean, like you said, do they sign and not pay? Do they, do they, you know, say they want to want a proposal or something and not even respond after that? They just ghost you or whatever. There's so many different ways. And the other thing that you said too, measuring each one of the steps in your sales process is yes. to who you know who so like if i have multiple sales people the you know what's damon's performance across each stage and what's other people's performance but overall what's our what's our process because our performance because these one of the things i think that i see i see companies doing that really really hurts in the long run is not standardizing the sales process and and i mean from a, and there's going to be there's nuances right you would sell differently than i did selling the same product but we still have same yeah. features benefits <clears throat> and we should have uh even simple things like how many meetings does it take before you get to the proposal and what do you do at each meeting yeah and, and you have to measure that differently because trying to measure like a meeting and you don't know I like to, I actually, I actually do two measurements on mine. I measure what it takes to get from meeting to close from the, the scheduling, the meeting to close. And then what I like to do is say, what am I real? What kind of salesmanship do I really, that, that tells me how my experience is. Then I go to my salesmanship, okay. which is af, at the meeting <clears throat> for the time that I first engage to my close, how well do I do? Because I want to know if that's, if that's doing better than just 
the experience because those are two different measurements, but it's the same funnel. Oddly enough, I'm mm -hmm. just adding one more and then I measure it differently because it I'm looking at from the initial setting a meeting to the close versus the actual meeting itself. So I've scheduled it. Now I've actually had the demo. What's the difference in, in closes? But you um, you brought something up, Damon. I totally forgot what it was that you brought up that I was going to tell you that, that oh, shoot. If I remember it, I'll come back to about it. About the steps, the steps in the sales process and what you do at each stage and how many stages of the sale process. Like, you know, you, you've got, it's a manufacturing company or a construction company, right? What yeah. is my process for selling? What is it? Well, I, and you know what's interesting is I get, this is I every, I probably say every, when I talk with a VP of sales, this is what I get. Have you ever set up XYZ company industry before? Yes. And then the next thing I get is, we want it done like you've done for them. No, you don't. It's not the way you do your business. You may be the exact, I have, I have, I have two realtors. I have, I actually have three realtors. Um, I've got manufacturing companies. I have um, SaaS companies, right? And they, and some even sell some of the same things. They're, they're competitive, right? Mm -hmm. no, I don't tell, you know, but my point is, is that they all do it differently. Because they have, yeah. everybody has their special sauce. So maybe yep. your special sauce is, well, we don't do one demo. We do a demo and a trial. And one company's yeah. like, well, we just do straight trial. They just sign up for it. Or we sell it this way or that way. Because that's your special sauce. So your your process has to match to that. Yes. So that it, it's not just, you know, we have a meeting and then we close. That's not how it goes. And I, ha I, I get some of those too. But every company is a little different. I have people that have um, six or seven steps in their sales process. And I have some that have three. I have some mm -hmm. that have 10. Now, my, my, for a SaaS company, five to six is good. So if you have anybody on here that's a SaaS, sells a software, five to six. Um, if you're a direct commodity, so it's a, it's a one and done sale. Somebody calls up, they want to buy your widget. You know, you may have like three things in your process. You still have a process. Yeah. Because your process is still to find out, like, are they interested? Are they a qualified buyer? Are they willing to pay? Is this the right time? Because if they're not one of the, you know, if they're not two of those things, you're going to put them in a marketing bucket or you're going to reach out to them later and try to get them on board. Right. But it's a one intent sale, meaning like, do you want it or don't you want it? And they're like, well, I don't know if I want it yet. Okay. Well, you're, you're, you're going to maybe take a little bit longer. Right. That's the tire kicker. So every, and yeah. it's understanding your clients too. So what type of client do I have? Maybe your, maybe your process isn't about steps. Maybe it's about identifying what type of person you're working with. And you, you identify those people and put them into buckets in your process. That a lot of different nuances that people miss or don't understand. And, and it's, you just have to sit down. I'll tell you, let me, let me tell you the secret sauce, of all this sit down and write out your process and yep. then go in and scrutinize it. If you took it apart and rebuilt it again, what would you remove that you think would cause your friction? And Damon, the reason I say that is because, 50 to 60% of the companies that I've talked to do not have a written out process. By the way, I've written mine out three times now in my own company. We, we revisit it almost every six months and I go through and I'm like, all right, let's scrap it all. What are we going to do differently? Because I want to remove, I'm like, can we just, can we automate this? Can we move this over here? People aren't buying this. Why are we even talking about it? Right. And I'm trying to mm -hmm. move things out of the way and simplify my process. And our sales have gone up. Because you've got to, it's, it's an engine. You've yeah. got to, you got to tune it up. And it's not about tuning the guys. The guys will always sell. You know, you're yeah. always going to find a sales guy. That's important. You've got to, you got to sharpen the saw over there, but you got to work on the engine too. So you got, you got the driver and the car. Okay. Yeah. You got the driver who has to have skill and you got to work on his skill. He's got to stay fit. He's got to be able to go three hours driving a car, turning left all the time. Right. I'm a big indie car guy. I love going. I've been eight times. Love it. Nice. And, 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 but the car, the engine itself, it's got to be fine tuned. It's got to be taken care of. You got to get new tires on it. It's got to get its oil change. It's gas, you know? And so when you put both of them together, now you get a, now you have a sports car, but it has to have both the driver and the vehicle. You can't just have the sports car. Most people think that Salesforce is like the sports car. And they're like, yes. And then I'm going to get a really good sales guy. And then they put them together and the guy doesn't know how to drive that sports car mm -hmm. <laughs> or he does. But he's like, why aren't you tuning the engine? And they're like, well, no, I got you the sports car. Aren't you the guy that knows how to tune it? No, I'm the driver. I don't know how to make your, I don't know how to make your car yeah. better. Think about it. Yeah, I don't know what that thing that. does behind me other than make me go yeah, fast. I, I've never seen blinker fluid or gulluminator <laughs> yeah. before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> nonsense part. Exactly. But that's 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 really that's the that's the that's a great analogy. I think to you'll. I have my wife hates me. I have a ton of metaphors and analogies for everything. So yeah, no this this is awesome though because you talk about something that I think people don't consider enough before they even talk about getting a sales uh, a CRM. Because if you don't know what your sales process is and you get a CRM, you're going to have to go back and figure that out in the first place. Or otherwise, you aren't going to get your CRM set up. Well, it goes back to what I said before. People think that the CRM is the solution. Like it'll already have it pre-built in there. Oh, it already Mm -hmm. has the process. It doesn't. It has the wherewithal to meet the process. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, man, this is awesome. This is, uh, I think now, now people, if you're, am I, if am, you, I, am I blowing your mind, Damon? Is that what's going no, on? No, no, this is great. This is great because we're, we're getting into the things where, where people really considering a CRM really should listen to this because it's not the solution. It's a tool that you yep. use to help you solve what you want to do, but it's going to take thought front end it's going to take thought during it's going to take refinement and you really need to understand that 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 what that tool is going to give you and what you have to give it to make it effective yeah and 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 don't get me wrong we love working with people that are like look we we kind of have a a nuance of what we want can you help Mm -hmm. us right but then i i still let people know you you still got to train these guys like they're the system the tool's not going to sell it i can put a playbook in that they can read from but they still have to hone in on the skills right yeah so it's it's not to say you can't work with a consultancy like mine to help you but but if you, one of the things we come back to people at the very beginning is okay tell us your process and that's the first thing that we do when we do a discovery walk me through your process where do your leads so the first place where do your leads come from that's yep. I, it's my it's my it's my first question where do your leads come from they come from here great and then how what do you do with them after that i i'll tell you a funny story damon i did this with a major company once we went through we went through their whole process leads go over here paperwork goes over here documents go over here you know they're passing things around you know it's a pretty yeah. sophisticated thing okay so they um they they walk through it with me and then what i would used to do is i used to sit down and i get on like a lucid chart or like a little charting tool and i would chart mm-hmm. it out i take their words and i i, I make it a display for them because in my next meeting, I was going to verify, they would tell me what they were doing, but they'd also tell me what they wanted. And so I put like what they're doing and what they want. I, I'd say, this is what you're doing. And then I'd show them another one. I was like, and then this is what how you want it to work. And they go, yes. Because I'd basically be, they'd have like 80 different things. And then I consolidate them and say, it's all going to be done here, right? So I'm talking to this company and they, <laughs> the lady, uh, I, I go through and I, and I can't actually devise my second diagram because in my first one, I have a gap in the process. So there's a process here and a process here. And there, I can't draw a line to it yeah. because I actually don't, they never told me how this gets passed over to this. And I assume that it just got Sally walked around the corner and handed the paper to, to bill or something. Right. Okay. So I get on the phone and there's about three people we're sitting on the phone and I'm like, all right, guys, let's go through this. I said, I have a question. I don't know where, how this gets over to this. Kid you not. All three people are like, do you, do you know? I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you know? I, David, can we, can we get back to you in a week? We, we don't know. And I said, I was like, what? You don't know where you're running, right? Like it, somebody's getting it. Somehow it's getting there, but they didn't know how. Yeah. They, um, they sat back and a week later, they said, uh, we just realized that we have a huge break in our process. We'll have to get back to you in a month. Cause oh, they wow. found out this is why it's so important to write out your process. Right. Yeah. All of a sudden, they found out that they had a huge. They were, they thought their company was failing because they didn't have a CRM. Their company was failing because they didn't know their process, and oh they had a goodness. bottleneck that they didn't even know that they had. And I'm the one who had to show it to them, and I was I was embarrassed for them because yeah. they're like, "We don't know." A most awkward conversation. So somebody not knowing how their company ran. So yeah, definitely important to lay out your steps. Yeah, but, but we can help you with that. And, and for them, theirs was a little more complicated. I couldn't tell them how to get the paper from A to B because it was a physical document they had to pass. It was, mm-hmm. it was back in the day when it, there was a lot more physical documents. I mean, this is like 10 years ago. So, yeah. but yeah, anyways. Well, and, and one of the things too, and that's a great point, you know, diagramming. It's, heck, just put it on a piece yeah. of paper and just ripple yeah. it out. Whiteboard, whatever. 
think about what your sales process looks like because you know I've been in these similar situations where we do we do value mapping in 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 a business right where we're value mapping okay how does the order flow through the company and you realize that holy heck we're double tripling you know tripling the work because it, it gets copied or whatever the the debt you know we got it oh god it's just a, a mass of wasted effort yep. and you you find that listen, there's so much opportunity to simplify here. And in the sales process, you can be making it really hard for your customers to buy what they want to buy from you. Yep. Um, I had a company we worked with, we found out that they, um, they had a CPQ, a, a, a quoting process issue, mm -hmm. where they sold these huge radiology machines. And, um, and they had a lot of parts to them and stuff. And so the sales guy would be really excited because he's selling this like half um, half a million dollar machine or million dollar machine, right? Mm -hmm. He goes through and he builds the quote, puts all the stuff in, gets all the main stuff, sells it to him. Come to find out, <laughs> he forgot to add the plug. And they, they're embarrassed, so they just throw the plug in. But the plug's ten thousand dollars. Oh my! They have to take a they have to take a loss because they didn't have a way to to figure out what they need added. So they needed. We helped them to create a process that said, okay, let's figure out in your tool that. If you add these items, you have to also add these items mm -hmm. so that they don't miss it in their in their system. And so that's that's key. And you know, and you can find out where you're losing money, right? Find out find out where you're losing money. Find out what is causing the rip. I'm telling you, twenty to thirty percent increase in yourself. And, and people, if you're if you're you know those that are on, if you don't believe me, try it out. Try just mm -hmm. map first, map your process, figure out where your leads come from, measure, measure, measure. And yeah. set goals and find, figure out what's going on, um, like what's causing. So you, it's it's okay. People are always like, "We're going to set a goal for one million. Let's do it." And in the back of my head, I go, "But how? How are yeah. you going to do that?" Well, we're just gonna we're gonna pump more money into marketing, really. But but how do you know that your marketing is effective? Did you measure it? Did you measure that your marketing is actually doing it, or were your? Because I worked for a company. They dumped a bunch of money into marketing. They had a million dollar budget for marketing. Okay. Small business, million dollar budget for marketing. And I sourced every one of my own leads. And I had a book of about in eight months, eight million dollars. The marketing team had probably produced maybe one tenth of that in the amount of yeah. time that I did. But they kept pumping money in the marketing team thinking that they were the reason why they're they're like, our website looks better. We have more followers on our YouTube channel. To watch our little Lego commercial that had nothing to do with what we sold. Bad, bad, bad. You're not measuring it correctly. That was a bad, speaking of bad measurements, yeah. make sure you're measuring the right thing. The right thing is end-to-end -end measurement. Did this equate to this? If you're just measuring this to see if it increases, not seeing if the other is having a correlation with it, you're getting nowhere. You have to see if correlation is, is there. And in your business, when you're doing stuff from marketing to sales to to fulfill it, it makes a big difference. And I tell people all the time, I said, you know, the other side of this, the, the other side of your friction where people lose money and you can make so much more money is in your retention. And people are like, well, mine's a one and done. They buy a, I actually just happened to have mine. They buy a Swiss army knife. That, that's it. I'm done. Well, this is my fifth Swiss army knife. Yeah. And it's because I like it. Right. Um, so if they like your product and it's good and they have a good experience with it, especially in a SaaS marketplace, mm -hmm. right. Or manufacturing a product, people will buy again. More importantly, they let their friends know, or they end up yes. moving to another company where they go, Oh, if you're going to buy knives, you're going to buy this. Knife. This is where this you buy it. Yep. And we've seen that in our own business. And we've been doing this four years and I've, my mindset, Damon has been, I'm going to start today to build relationships with people that will probably become my customer four years from now or five years from now. I'd never expect anybody to be my customer today. I expect them to be my customer in, in five years when they go, Oh, you know what? I've moved and I'm over here or I happen to go to a new company and I was in, and I'm in this new department and they just happened to bring up HubSpot. And I said, I know Davey, right? Mm -hmm. I, by the way, I get those calls all the time. I love them. They're my favorite thing. I love being called the HubSpot guy. Right. My yeah. wife knows this. I go in home. We were at a, we were in the home spot guy. And I, I was at an event. It was, it was it, like when we were first starting and some guy came up to me and he goes, Oh, you're the hub spot guy. And I, I was all smiling. I went over to my wife. My wife was with me at this little dinner. I go, mom, sweetheart. They call me the hub spot guy. And she's like, 
<laughs> what is that right? I go, honey, they did it. I'm, I'm, I finally made, met my accolade. But that's what happens, right? The service side, you know, people recognize you. And then when you get recognized, and we're not talking like viral YouTube, TikTok stuff. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about the fact that you're good at what you, you do and that people want to come back and work with you, right? They see yeah. a reason to work with you and you reduce that friction. And, but that's money. Think about your revenue. That wasn't the sales guy. That wasn't even marketing. That was because your customer service, your fulfillment team did well. Yeah. I worked for a company where I was doing projects. The company I got laid off from, okay, they laid me off because they couldn't afford me. And the funny thing is I was on my way out anyways. And the reason I was leaving is because they kept telling me to sell and they couldn't fulfill for my current clients. Pepsi was one of my clients. Yeah. Pepsi, big company. Yeah. We were three months behind on a project. Oh three my. Months for, for a three month project. So we're six months in and they, they've been patient with me. And I'm like, guys, I'll get you an answer. I couldn't get an answer for the life of me where the project was, when we could get it completed, what was stopping it and why we weren't working to get it done. Nobody would answer me. And I said, and then they come to me like, hey, by the way, you need to close like another like three million this next month. And I'm like, why? If you're not fulfilling, me selling three million doesn't do it because that money will never come in because you'll never yeah. fulfill for that guy. I said, yeah. you got to fix your process. So revenue isn't just on the sales team. It's the whole company. Yes, it it's is. Your, it's your marketing team helping your sales team. It's working together to find out what, what is beneficial. It's your sales team working with your fulfillment team and your past how you pass that over it's your fulfillment team working with marketing on how they outreach again to those additional clients or find mm -hmm. out where they've moved to or or if they've expressed and, the, and who they're talking to or hey you know we we all do the old i i hate this i would never come to you Damon, and be like by the way do you have three friends that you could think of this week that would use hubspot i hate that question what i'd rather do is be friends with you which we are we've been friends for what mm -hmm. two years now yeah, yeah and, and, years. and continue to meet up with you and, and one day you go Hey, by the way, I know somebody that needs some HubSpot help and you're the only guy I know, right? Yeah. That's what I, that's, that's, that's the, that's the best thing for me, right? Yeah. So, because we have a relationship and that, that builds up over time. I'm not going to ask you for referrals. You're never, Damien, I, honestly, could you think of even one person right now where like, oh my gosh, I need to send, I'm going to introduce Davey today because, oh my, you know, maybe you aren't right now because we've been talking about it for 45 minutes, but but before this, if I'd come to you and be like, hey, Damon, before we start, do you know somebody? Yeah, not, not cold, not cold, because yeah. it happens. It, this kind of stuff happens. And that's the, th that's the thing about these, these relationships. I like your five-year, four or five-year timeline, because that's how that's how people really build businesses. It's not like a flash in the, you know, flash in the present. That's going to, going to make the relationships and build these long-term stable businesses. It's, yeah. it's building the relationships over time that, that people, you are the HubSpot guy. You are well, the guys that, that will, will solve the problems. I, I think, has it been three years now? I think it's been three that we've known each other. Might have. Two yeah, or three. Yeah, might, yeah. yeah. Okay. So when you first met me and we met, did you go, well, this kid's got kind of a pipe dream of a job. I hope he does well. You know, he seems to know his stuff. I hope he stays in business. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. Did you, I would have, I would have been like, this kid's got a pipe dream, right? You probably for a second were like, well, I hope things go well for you. I'll give you a little bit of advice. We'll see where you go. But you're like, I hope he makes it. And here we are uh, almost, it's going to be five years um, yeah. this fall, right? It's going to be five years this fall. And um, it, it, I'm like, my mind's blown by that. Yeah. But consistency, right? That, that makes a it big is. part of it. So anyways, I know you got a lot, some other CRM questions. We don't need to go into philosophy. No, no, this, business, this but. is great because, you know, the one one of the things that that I really want to talk about a little bit is is first of all, what are some of the exciting things we're gonna because we're gonna talk about two things before we finish yeah. up today. One of them is gonna be CRMs themselves, but then I also want to talk about the fact that you guys are not marketing and 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 do but doing HubSpot. So uh, let's talk about some of the things that you see exciting that you see CRMs doing now and you see that they might be doing in the future that it's like, whoa, blow my mind kind of stuff. Yeah. So what I want you to think of with CRM and, and it, it's always evolving. And look, no, I, I, I do HubSpot, right? No downer to HubSpot, but I'm sure 10 years from now, it's gonna, there's going to be somebody else. Right, mm -hmm. it's gonna yep. kick the marketplace and do awesome, and, and HubSpot's gonna have their 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 good solid base. They're gonna be solid. I think they are solid um, as a company, and they're gonna stick around. Right, they're gonna be that IBM in their yeah. space. 
Yeah. Um, they're doing it right now. I'm actually like, I hitched my wagon to this four years ago and I'm just shocked that they've, they've done so well, but um, it's going it's what's getting amazing about um, CRM is that it has to be adaptable to the newest trends. So l- let me give you an example. HubSpot is one of the, the number one marketing automation tools in the world has been ranked by a couple different groups that mm-hmm. can be argued with others. But anyways, I'll, I'll say that cause that's who I represent, but, and I've got, I've got some, um, stats behind that well you're on facebook right because we Mm -hmm. you're on facebook you're on linkedin linkedin's been around Mm -hmm. linkedin's become a staple my question is what's going to beat out linkedin i always wonder that that's like the newest thing for me is like what's going to beat linkedin um i used to teach linkedin skills to college kids like i don't know like 10 years ago it was weird and i used to tell them all the time i was like promote yourself not your business now it's like promote your business not yourself um (laughs) but um you've got things like TikTok that are out now, right? Yeah. And I'm waiting to see how does HubSpot pivot because they do social media, but TikTok is a kind of a beast and there's nobody's really locked it down yet as a catalyst for business. Like business people have found ways to be influencers and be um, do advertising on it. But as a business for yourself, like Damon, I've got my, I've got my marketing gal. I'm like, figure out a way for us to do little TikTok things. It's having a huge impact on people i just want to be relevant but at the same time i'm like i don't know where it's going i think that's the story there is where is crm going crm is going to follow the trend right the trend is how can you make it easy so think of it from a sales process how do i make things easy if if we're making it easy for a client to come and sign up for something online it's going to remove some sales guys and they're going to be more consultants they're going to be architects for something. They're going to be mm-hmm. solution. I, I, I used to coin the term, I guess it is a term. Um, I used to say solutionizer. People would be like, Who, what, what, do you, what are you? I'm a solutionizer, right? Let's figure out what the solution is. Yeah. And so as we see, um, sales is still sales. I've, I've got two Miller Hyman books on my shelf over here, and they still teach the same principles today since the dawn of, of Christ, <laughs> the same principles yeah. of treat your fellow mankind. Uh, honestly, if you read any sales book, that's a good sales book. Um, not one of these guys. It's like, I'm going to be really loud and proud. Right. But true salesmanship is those same principles. They're, um, they're, you know, finding out what the need is, fulfilling the need, finding out what their pattern is and communicating with people properly, right. Building a relationship. But I mean, I had a client today, find out what their ROI is, right. What's I talked to the company and I said, okay, if we fix this problem, cause I had no idea how to, where to even start. I said, if I fix this problem, do you have any idea how much you think you might increase? And they said, 10%. I said, that's great. Let's figure out how much revenue you make. Do you know what your revenue is? And they said, yeah. And I said, it's a couple of million. And I'm like, so you're saying, you're saying that if we do this, I'm going to save you. I'm going to help you make another quarter of a million, if not millions more technically. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah. And I said, well, then my price is going to be a drop in the bucket Yeah. (laughs) because I'm so, I'm so much less than that. And I'm going to be able to do it in four months time. And you're going to get in rock and roll. And they're like, great. We're sold. That, that, that was fast. It was at five minutes. They were sold. They just wanted to, they wanted to check my credentials and, you know, then yeah. they wanted to figure out like why I recommended whatever it was. But, but I think that, that we're going to find ways to speed up processes. We're going to figure out ways to CRM is going to figure out ways to automate more stuff. Right. Yeah. So when I get on my phone right now, I have to get onto my app and make a phone call. I can make a phone call from my app. Eventually, somebody's going to come up with the process that when I make a phone call and I get off and they're like, hey, this person's in your CRM. Do you yeah. want to log that call versus going to the CRM, calling them from the CRM and then logging it? They're just going to it's going to know and it's just going to log and then it's going to get auto log for me. Right now, yeah. my emails get auto logged, whereas before when I was doing Salesforce, you had to like pick and choose what you logged in the system from another from a third party app. HubSpot yeah. has it built in and does it automatically. And I can do it from multiple emails. It. It's just an evolution of automation that occurs, and um, evolution of automation. Yep. Yeah, that's that's really what it's coming down to is that they're just going to speed up because the reality is this doesn't change, Damon. You and I are still going to yeah. talk. Yeah. You're not going to buy my consultancy just because you read something on my website. Yeah. Because if that was the case, everybody overseas that scams you now is going to scam you even more. Mm-hmm. Right. We all want to know that we have a physical person to talk to. And that, yeah. that we're going to work with. We're going to look, can I, I'm going to get on a soapbox real quick for just one minute. 
Yeah. This work, this work from home stuff. You're working from home, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But you own your business. That's different. Yeah. For these companies that have work from home, IBM did this already. And then they called everybody back and then the pandemic hit. It was really funny. They put every, I think it was back in 2013 or 14 or whatever. IBM's like, we're going to have people work from home. We think it's going to be more effective. And then I think in 2018, 17, something like that, like a couple of years later, they're like, nope, we're bringing everybody back. And then bam, pandemic hit. And then everybody yeah. went back to working from home. And so, and for, I think what we're finding is that it's a test. These industries are going to do really well work from home. These industries over here, no, they're going to come in the office. Why? Because yeah. people need to meet. Like, I think it was like the capital growth companies had a huge issue because they couldn't get in front of their CEOs. And as soon yeah. as they could travel, as soon as they could travel, they were trying to get to them before the other guy was to make sure they got the future deal because yeah. it was the handshake that made the difference. And so yeah. people were like, ah, I, the handshake doesn't matter. It does matter because I want to be able to look you in the eye. I want to be able to meet with you in person. I want to size you up mm -hmm. for who you are. And make sure that this is gonna this is gonna be you know what's gonna be so evolution wise the CRM is gonna grow and automate, but the person to person the fact that we can do video calls like this even right now add yeah. value and we're just gonna find more and more ways to to reach across virtually to one another but we're still gonna have Zoom meetings and and eventually we'll have like you know I'm a Star Trek Star Wars guy so go. we're gonna have hologram you know I'm gonna be standing here and you're gonna be able to see me in 3D and I'm gonna be able to reach out my I guess the meta world, which freaks me out a little bit, but we'll, does, we'll meet yeah. in the meta world, right? Eventually. And eventually that'll get adopted. Right now it's getting, it's getting its kinks out. It's weird for people. It's like when um, online dating came out. When <laughs> online dating came out, I made fun of everybody that met their wife through online dating or met some girl. I'm like, that's not going to work out. She's going to catfish you. Like, this isn't real. You know, how are you going to get to know somebody online? Well, <laughs> do you know how many people are, are, are married now because they met somebody online? Heck, my wife and I, we met in person, but we connected via Facebook for our first yeah. date and communicated for a while before we went on our first date. We were still some yeah. uh, semi-online dating, as you'd call it, right? That's like a norm yeah. now. So yeah. anyways, okay. So, well, I think I think this, and in, in you bring up a good thing, is the CRMs have to be flexible. And this is one of the things that I see with systems overall for business, because one of the things I really, really, really think we learned that's positive from the work from home experience is that hybrid works, hybrid work situations are so awesome for a lot of people because yeah. yes, you need to be in the office for mentoring, for camaraderie, for team building, for just doing some things as, as a team and project type yep. settings. Yeah. That's awesome for it. But when you got people like where, where I'm at in Seattle that are commuting three hours a day or two hours a day when they can oh, yeah. go from five days a week to three days a week and, yep. and set their schedule, their life changes drastically yep. because they know, they know that, Hey, Wednesdays, I don't drive to work because that's the worst traffic day. And, yep. and, and that's the day that they can, you know, take the kid to school in the morning or, or sleep in for an hour, you know, they're going to, they're going to have satellite. And, they're going to have satellite images of cities during COVID where they're going to see like, and look how many people, and then look how it grew again and went back. Like, yeah, punctuated. they're going to have like these weird pictures. It's going to be like animal migrations. They're like, and when the water <laughs> changed, you'll see the migration of the, you know, bighorn sheep move from here to here. That's what we're going to see. We're going to see this human population movement. I call it the, by the way, I call it the, uh, with the, all this moving, I call it the, we used to have the westward expansion. I call this the inward expansion. New York and California have been cult, uh, been coming into middle America again. Yeah. And I call it the inward expansion. Literally, and it's true though, because we've seen statistically speaking, I coined yeah. a term that nobody they're going to put in history books that later on. Thought uh, we're going to talk about the years between uh, 2019 and 2025 uh, with the inward expansion, and you know what caused it. So, anyways, yeah. Well, let's get to your let's get to your other question because you're wondering yeah, so, about so wh you, how, why I'm the only guy. Why 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 did you choose to do HubSpot implementation but not marketing? Great question. Let's end with this. So, um. Here's the deal. I I hitched my wagon to something that I was hoping would take off and and compete with with Microsoft Dynamics and Zoho and Salesforce, of course, right? Because that's what I was used to. Mm -hmm. And I saw a pathway for HubSpot. I went, okay, I'm going to do this, and I really, really, I'm praying and wishing that they do this. And I got lucky. Okay, so I don't recommend it for anybody. I took I took a big chance. They all <laughs> of a sudden came out and said, hey, we're going to do custom objects. We're going to do these are 
we're going to do development stuff. This is all stuff that helps me compete with yeah. larger CRMs. And I was like, yes, we've got the big, we've got the tools now that I can go and compete. And what's interesting for us is I, I started this way. We've never done, um, we've done, well, I shouldn't say we've never done. We've tinkered with a few things in it, but we try to stay away from it. And that is the marketing side of HubSpot. HubSpot, number one marketing automation tool. Yep. And then here I am selling it as a CRM that can beat out Salesforce. Yeah. That's like blowing people's minds. It was even a question I, I laughed because I was telling my buddy, I said, um, as soon as somebody goes, so you used to do Salesforce. When I hear that in my conversations, I know the next question is, so why do you think Salesforce or HubSpot's better than Salesforce? It's always the next question, right? Yeah. So you used to do Salesforce. And um, what I realized is that there needed to be, I, I'm actually following a playbook that I did when I was doing Salesforce, which is I'm starting kind of slow. We're a small consult seat, but I'm focusing on one area that I think we do really well. And it seems like it's really broad, but it's, it's, it's truly the nature of what we do, which is mm -hmm. we help architect the system and provide, we have expertise in several different areas within it, within my team, they can help bring it together for one solution. And the reason what's interesting is we are, um, so right now we're in the top 3% of HubSpot partners worldwide, um, or at least in the U.S., in the U.S., not worldwide, let's say U.S. I want to make sure I'm quoting myself correctly. Yeah. Um, top 3% in the U.S., um, the reason that we are a niche or an anomaly is because most partners for the last 15 years have been marketing agencies and they have made great business. And it's been part-time. Like a lot of them, they're like HubSpot was just one of the accolades of maybe doing Eloqua or Marketo or, um, uh, uh sales cloud or, or, or marketing cloud with, uh, Salesforce. And they did all of them. And they were just good marketing experts and they just understood mm -hmm. we're going to put a campaign in here. Well, I've got my Salesforce expert, my Eloqua expert, my HubSpot expert, and we'll, we'll build the campaigns over here and then we'll have our guy implement it over here. Well, HubSpot stepped up and said, look, we're, we're really good at marketing, but we keep getting people that need to manage their, their leads. And every single, and, and Brian Halligan said it best. He's like, I started using Salesforce and I hated it. I hated the difficulty of setting it up, working within it. I had a bunch put a bunch of tools up that he's like, so I just made my own. And I went, well, that's great. Because what happened is you took something and, and, and they built it right because they, they took what people were saying what that they should do and they built it right. Salesforce, if you get in Salesforce, it, take, it gives you a lead that then you convert to a, an opportunity and a, an account and a contact. It sucks. It's the thing. It's the first thing we used to do with people is we'd say, Hey, the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to immediately convert. We're going to auto convert all of your leads. Why? Because a lead would stand alone. And so if we were with the same company, they'd have Damon and Davey. We'd both be leads, but we'd never cross paths in the system. Oh. We'd just be two different leads and we'd be working independently. It was dumb. And HubSpot, they're all contacts. And guess yeah. what? Every other, Hub, every other CRM now realize that that's dumb, but Salesforce hasn't change their ways. You know, other people are like, well, I'm a B2C, so it makes sense. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You need to have a contact. You need to be able to attract that. You and I work for the same company so I can see all of the activity of that company in one place. Salesforce had done that and put it all in one place, but only after you converted it. So you'd actually lose yeah. momentum because you're calling on the same company. Sales guys were calling on the same company two, three, four, 10, 20 times because they had 20 leads in there when they already had a deal moving through the pipeline over here. So I recognize that HubSpot was moving in this direction and then they just, they just laid it on. They just put some gasoline on about it a year and a half ago, almost two years. How long has it been? And, and then they're just taking off more. And in, in, in a week and a half is their conference. And if anybody's interested, they're going to be laying out a whole bunch of new stuff that they're doing, which is going to be phenomenal. I've been able to take a peek at some of it. It's awesome. It takes us next level. I'm really excited for it. I wish I could tell you about it because we're actually working with some of it right now we're already in on nice. some of the betas and stuff and it's cool and what it is is it's just helping make things simpler easier more effective better communication so the reason that by the way i i invite i am working with several different partners i go to them all the time and i'm like let me tell you what we're doing and how we architect because i need competition competition is healthy I truly believe in it i want tons of competitors because competitors help breed more clients for me. Because mm -hmm. when people realize that it works, like I said, that five-year thing, five years from now, people are going to be looking for, uh, they're going to be like, well, we used HubSpot before and it actually worked out. 
they're going to go to a new company and it's going to spread like wildfire. And that's how, that's how Salesforce did it, by the way. Salesforce, I remember getting on phone. People were like, well, I don't know. I mean, this company's still kind of new and they're kind of weird. You know, we're going to stick with our dynamics or our Oracle. And I'm like, okay, that's what it was back in like 2013. People were like, I don't know if I want to do Salesforce. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's what people are doing right now. I don't know if I want to do HubSpot, you know? And, and I'm like, you, you should, it's the next evolution. It makes sense. You'll be better off. And, and, and especially since you don't use 50% of your Salesforce system anyways, yeah. why not use a system where you can use almost hundred percent of it and actually use the tools that you need. So I think that we, the reason we've done this is because we think it's effective. I, anyways, gone over damn it, but really appreciate it. Man, Davey, it has been incredible having you on today. I knew I was going to learn a lot. I knew that we were going to see this from a different perspective because you don't talk about the CRM from a marketing perspective. You talk about it from a sales and sales process perspective, which I think is where people can really, really, really leverage the power of a CRM to, as you say, reduce the friction in the sales process. So yeah. people that were listening, I just want to tell you, go back and listen to some of the stuff that Davey said. And also, Davey, how can people get a hold of you if they want to talk to you about HubSpot, about, you know, CRMs and things like that? Yeah, um, appreciate that. Thanks for letting me put a plug in. Um, uh, you can go to Paragon, P-E-A-R-A-G-O-N.com. It's a play yeah. on the word. Um, a, a pair is our logo. So pair and then A-G-O-N. Dot com. Um, there'll be a place on there for a free consultation. We do audits of people's HubSpot for free. Um, we do free consultation and talk with you about what CRM you're on and what you're looking at or maybe considering it. Before you buy HubSpot, come talk with me because we, um, we actually help negotiate great pricing for our clients um, on the licenses. Um, and even though it's already inexpensive, we can help you to get a little bit more to help some of those smaller businesses that are getting started. So yeah, feel free nice. to reach out. Um, you'll probably talk with me directly or one of my other sales guys, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, thanks everyone for being here today. Thanks, Davey. We had Davey Warren today from Paragon talking about CRM uh, configuration and implementation challenges. And man, did we get a schooling on how you use your CRM to make your sales process better. Let's just think about this, get back, get into the, the different spots in this. There were several just golden nuggets that Davey dropped when we were talking. I want you to go back and listen to those. I also want to thank everyone who is listening today and just thanks for being here. We're going to take a couple weeks off for the vacation or for the holidays coming up because I, oh my goodness, can you believe it's almost summer's almost over? The kids back in school and everything like that. It's crazy. So we will be back in a couple weeks. Thanks everyone for being here.